Here we are. Welcome to it. This is Outside the Box. It's our EMS podcast to drive clinical performance here in the Sugarland Fire Department. I'm really excited about this platform because this is where we're going to take unfamiliar things and start to make them familiar. We're going to start taking the uncomfortable things and making them comfortable and continuing to grow in the way we perform clinical medicine here in the city of Sugarland. So to help me kick things off today as we talk about heart failure, I have Captain Michael Bell with me. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Yes, sir. Um, really excited to get into this topic because this is something that you and I have chatted about a little bit before. Um, but let's take a quick minute and talk about let's talk about you. So tell us just just a little bit. How long you've been here? How long you've been in medicine? Uh, what kind of experience you're bringing to the table in this position here? All right. So I've been in the fire service for going on twelve years. Um, spent five years down. South Texas and Victoria, Texas, um, got my paramedic while I was down there. So I've been a paramedic for going on 11 years. Um, the remainder of my time outside of that five years has been with Sugarland Fire Department. Uh, recently promoted, I say recently, it's been about a year and a half going on two years, uh, promoted to captain, which is uh, taking on the role of EMS supervision. Um, with that comes uh, a lot of tr specialty training on um, the vision of where our, our EMS uh, treatment is going in the future, um, and what we're providing to these patients out in the field. So it's been a really cool experience working with you and Dr. Humphreys, getting exposure to a lot of new things in the EMS world. Nice, nice. Yeah. So we're gonna talk about some cool heart failure stuff. It's gonna mm -hmm. be cool. Um, but before we do, what I like doing, and maybe I'm just the nerd who likes doing it, I like to think back of when I first learned about heart failure and what are some things that stand out in your mind from when you first learned you're reading your paramedic textbook about heart failure. What are some nuggets that have kind of that still stand out have been there all along? Yeah. So when I first started learning about heart failure, I would say the biggest thing is you can overcomplicate it. It is a really, really easy subject to over overcomplicate. Um, and a lot of people will come up with tricks on how to remember, you know, right sided right sided failure versus left sided failure. Um, but, you know, for us at the end of the day, we have our treatment plan for those patients. And, um, you know, it's just there's no need to overcomplicate it. There's a lot of good informational videos on YouTube, uh, good training videos and things like that that, that get down to the nitty gritty of heart failure. Um, you can spend a lot of time dwelling on that. And again, you can overcomplicate it, but it's really not that difficult to understand when you, when you start breaking it down. So, well, especially in the pre-hospital setting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, essentially heart failure for us is, I mean, the heart's dying. Yeah. Right. So it, it's a cardiac output problem for us. And as we dive into this and talk about some of the pathology, heart failure is always secondary to something. Mm -hmm. is, is the other part of it that uh, a lot of pre-hospital medicine tends to land in the symptom management side of things. And right. I think heart failure is absolutely one of those things that um, we, we have a, a low, uh, low circulation. We got low perfusion. We have poor respiratory effort. All of these things, we kind of piecemeal together solutions. And we're going to talk about the bigger picture, what we're looking at here today. But... That's, that's kind of how I thought of it, too, coming up is just uh, there's there's too much water in the lungs. There's too much water in the feet. Right. Heart failure. Go. But I actually it, it, I remember it always being a standalone issue mm -hmm. um, that a lot of times we're dealing with a STEMI that produces acute heart failure. Uh, we're yeah. dealing with um, other complications, other dysfunctions that produces acute heart failure or an acute like tipping point of chronic heart failure, that we yeah. have people that with the prolonged hypertension, untreated, mm -hmm. unmanaged, and then just this little tipping point. Yeah, we, we have exceeded the compensation, right? Yep. Um, so when we treat heart failure, it literally is just symptom management. It's treating the symptoms that came secondary to whatever this other ailment is. So Correct. Right. And like I said, it, it's essentially, it's, it's cardiac output. You can put it with any of your cardiac rhythm management that, again, I'm a soapbox about reference ranges. 
and whatnot. Um, we can have a heart rate that's faster, faster than normal. Normal. Normal's lame, but <laughs> faster than normal. And I'm not worried until it compromises the ability to circulate blood, right? Same thing with, with low that, again, oh, you'll hear it plenty. But the Chicago kid from the 90s, Michael Jordan's the goat, LeBron. Mm -mm. <laughs> Jordan's resting heart rate when he was playing ball was 33. So it's a very low heart rate by the book. Yeah, but adequate cardiac output, right? So same thing with heart failure. We could be dealing with a heart failure patient with adequate cardiac output. And we don't necessarily need to do a lot for that patient. Right. So you, it is possible to hinder those patients too, which absolutely. we'll get into later once we start digging into some of this stuff. But absolutely. Yeah, so, you can you can take away that compensation and, and definitely yep. put them over that tipping point and hurt them. It, right. So, so all right, so let's dive into this. Let's talk about um actual heart failure pathology presentation the presentation of a heart failure patient hasn't changed since no. you and i learned it so what right why don't you explain for that just some general impression patient presentation and heart failure yeah so the big thing with heart failure is going to be edema whether it's uh pulmonary edema it's in the lungs which again we'll get into later what causes that versus uh the pitting edema that ends up in the lower extremities of the patient the ascites of the abdomen, um, they're usually hypertensive, tachycardic, um, in respiratory distress if they have that pulmonary edema. And so it's, it's pretty evident when you walk into a room and you come across a heart failure patient, it's, it's pr pretty quick to recognize, hey, this person's sick. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of which type of failure they're having, which side, which it is possible to have right and left sided failure at the same time too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the, just to back up. So when you think of the heart, when it comes to heart failure, the heart's just a pump, right? And so uh, regardless if it's the, the right side or left side, whatever's going on, that blood is coming from somewhere. And so if that part of the, the pump fails, now that fluid is backing up because it has nowhere to go, right? And so that's just kind of the, the down and dirty way to think of heart failure and, and what's going on in the, in the patient's body. Yeah. And I think... We obviously are looking at this respiratory distress when there's fluid in the lungs. We've, we've lost a lot of that pulmonary capacity. So that mm -hmm. is very apparent. Um, we're going to have trouble breathing when yeah. we have edema in the legs and the lungs are just fine. And we got to remember that this is the body trying to compensate, that we're working more to breathe harder because if we don't have cardiac output going, we have fluid accumulating somewhere else. Right. Yeah. We're not getting the perfusion. Right. So... It's an interesting thing that you're right. We get those ones. We'll see them being sick. And some of them we can hear from across the room. And I don't need a stethoscope for this one. But then there's ones you go expecting to hear that congestion in the lungs. And it's it's not there. We're just dealing with the other side of the heart. That's all it is. Yeah. So um, regardless of one side of the heart or the other, there's a couple little points that will help us differentiate. But really, there's some classic carryover presentation in this. So, Correct. Um, so let's talk about these, these compensation uh, pieces because that's what we're going to see in vital signs. Mm -hmm. So what, what do we expect to see in heart rate, in blood pressure with these kind of heart failure patients? Yeah. So typically as they're compensating, everything's going to be increasing, trying to help the body out, which is maladaptive, right? So all the body's doing is trying to compensate for this issue, this heart failure that's going on. But in the meantime, while it's doing this compensation, it's just making everything worse. And so it's just piling on top of each other, which is where we come in to say, hey, time out. Let's hit the reset button and fix mm -hmm. some of these symptoms that are going on. Right. It's, it's like when you come ask me to help with a house project that I'm not going to help like you want me to be able to help. But yeah, I'm fun being there. Yeah. So, but not really, <laughs> not really helpful. Right. So there's that word maladaptive um, and to really dig into it that the heart will recognize poor perfusion. So the heart rate will increase to try and circulate more blood mm -hmm. to get there as well as meet its own oxygen demand. And then we'll breathe faster because that's more volume coming in and out of the lungs. Uh, but then it becomes cyclic, right? Yep. Then the, the kidneys start dumping hormones, the angiotensin, the renin, uh, aldosterone. These are hormones that are very functional to preserve water when we need to hold on to water in when we need vasoconstriction. So any given time we get some vasoconstriction, these hormones have a big part of that. Um, and angiotensin actually converts 
using the angiotensin angiotensin converting enzyme, the ACE, right? Or ACE inhibitors mm -hmm. is when we see our hypertension patients because we want to not have that conversion. But these hormones dump to try and raise blood pressure because the body sees poor perfusion. It must be low blood pressure. Let's raise the blood pressure. But then it doesn't stop. It keeps dumping hormones. And this is where we get the blood pressures of 240 over 120. Um, we get the heart rates up in the 100, 120, 130 range, right? Because we get the catecholamine dump because the heart's panicking, yep. freaking out, dumping the hormones to get the blood vessels constricted, dumping the catecholamines to get the heart rate up, and it just it just goes. So if I dump catecholamines, make the heart beat faster to get more circulation, but doesn't fix the problem, then I'll dump more catecholamines, and I'll dump more and more and more and more until we just get this crashing cycle of I have outworked my ability to breathe, uh, my blood vessels are so clamped down, I can't get any circulation, arrhythmias, asystole, we know the progression, right? right? Yep. So, um, and something else that was really fun to read about as we were preparing for this is cardiac tissue remodeling, right? The heart will recognize, hey, I need to move more volume. So it will change its shape of the ventricle. It'll get bigger and stretch out the ventricle wall so there's more space for volume or it will try and thicken itself up a little bit so it can make a stronger squeeze. Both of them tend to be maladaptive. That right. We, we thicken the ventricle wall to make a stronger squeeze, but none of that muscle is getting oxygen to squeeze. Yep. Or we thin it out so much that it's stretched to the point that there's really no flexibility to it, and it's, it's just a rigid piece of tissue anymore. So heart failure that becomes uncompensated, is, it is. Like you described, it's this runaway train. We've got to get in there and disrupt this process a little bit if we're going to have any hope. Because there's some pretty good mortality rates and morbidity rates when it comes to heart failure. Yep. Like we said, it's secondary to something else. So mm -hmm. sick, sick person, right? So let's talk about these, these maladaptive things. You had mentioned the left side of the heart, the right side of the heart. How do these differ? What, what kind of things are we going to see? with one side versus the other. Right. And so let's break the heart down kind of back to the basics. So the right side of the heart is going to be pushing blood into the pulmonary vessels to reoxygenate, which are going to go to the left side of the heart to be pushed out to the systemic vessels to push that oxygenated blood out to the body. And so again, think of the heart as a pump. If the right side fails, you're now going to get that fluid back up because it's not moving anything. Right. And regardless of what's causing the failure in front of it, whether it's uh, pulmonary hypertension or just that uh, right ventricle over time has worked so hard and remodeled to a point where it can't keep up anymore, it's not pushing enough blood, um, that fluid is now backing up into the systemic vessels because that's where it's coming from, into that right side of the heart, right? So that's where you get your pitting edema, uh, the ascites of the abdomen, and then on the reverse side, the, the left side of the heart. So when you're, uh, when you're pumping out of the left side of the heart, you're going to the systemic vessels where, well, that blood going to the left atrium is coming from the lungs, the pulmonary vessels. So it's bringing that oxygenated blood to the left side to be pumped to the body and dispersed. Well, when the left side of the pump fails, you're now backed up into the lungs. And so that's kind of the, the difference. Right. And one side of the heart failing is going to cause the other side of the heart to fail. Correct. Right? So just like you're talking about that the left is the big strong side mm -hmm. that can produce this kind of pressure. But if the right's not doing its job to pump through the lungs, that's backup pressure in the systemic circulation, like you said. Yep. We call that afterload, right? We all know that term. The systemic resistance that we're pumping against the left ventricle pumping against just climbs and climbs and climbs. And when we can't move the blood, so the body recognizes, oh no, poor perfusion, dump the catecholamines, mm -hmm. pump harder and faster, um, let's get some vasoconstriction, and then we're off to the races, right? Right. And same thing like you're saying with um, the left side failing, we get it back in the lungs, the lungs fill with this junk, we can't exchange gas, body has poor perfusion, oh no, Heartbeat harder, faster, blood vessels constrict, off to the races, right? And it is, and the right side's only going to last so long, being a smaller chunk of tissue. Correct. It's also pumping against that tissue. So we worry about 
fluid accumulating in the lungs mm -hmm. and not getting gas exchange, right? But then the right side's pumping against that. And the thing we need to realize is that's increased pressure. That's pulmonary hypertension, that that pulmonary artery gets backed up and filled and there's nowhere for it to go. That little guy's pushing against some good resistance there. Correct. Right. So that's like sitting there uh, closing off the nozzle, but somehow dialing up the engine pressure, hoping that water is going to come out the other end. And it's not going to come out the nozzle. It's going to come out somewhere, but not really the nozzle, right? Right. Um, okay. So what's our classic treatment, though? How do we treat heart failure? Nitrates and CPAP. Boom. That's Done. it. Podcast over. <laughs> you guys. Right. We could talk about left sided and right sided. Uh, we either way, we're talking about just poor cardiac output. We're talking about congestion somewhere in the body. We're talking about excessive pressure somewhere. Um, the right side is either pumping against high pulmonary pressures or the left side is trying to pump against high systemic pressures. What do, what do nitrates do for our vascular system? They're going to open up the blood vessels, make right. it easier, so, make it easier on the heart. Right. We're going to counteract some of those hormones that are vasoconstricting everything mm -hmm. with this systemic vasodilation. Um, and that's what makes nitro a good broad approach to heart failure is that there's pressure somewhere. So just dilate the whole container. Yep. Right. Um, we get to be a little bit more specific about it and we'll dig into some of these therapies and, and why we want certain benefits of them and, and how we go. Um, but let's focus in on the left because this gives us a really good opportunity. And on the left side itself, we can have two types of heart failure. Right. Why don't you tell us about those? So you have uh, the diastolic failure, which is going to be an issue with the heart filling up. So the ventral it doesn't have the ability to fill the chamber up. Um, whereas the uh, uh, systolic side, you have an issue ejecting the blood out of the heart. Right. Again, it, the diastolic is all pressures. It's again with the pressure, the dang pressures. Yep. If there's too much pressure in the ventricle, right, like it's actually going to start coming out the wrong way, then filling up. So with our classic traditional means, how do we tell the difference between a filling problem and an ejection problem? So traditionally, there isn't a way to tell. Mm. Mm. So There's we're just no talking way about something, something that's cool. That's all we're really putting in the podcast then. Is that what we're saying? That's it. Right. We're not going to treat ejection or filling any differently because we, we don't know the difference. Or do we? We do have tools that allow us to, to tell the difference now. All right. So, so what, why don't you tell us about this fun device that we have out there? Yeah. So... Uh, one of the new things that we've brought to Sugarland uh, Fire and EMS is the ultrasound. So we're doing POCUS point of care ultrasound. Um, we bring it in to the call with us. We're at the patient. We can go ahead and start scanning them, dig deeper into this issue and figure out what's actually going on. So um, specifically when it comes to POCUS and heart failure, there's three things we can look at. Uh, one obviously being the heart. Um, the other being the lungs and the other being the inferior vena cava, which we'll dive into. Um, but we'll start off with the heart. So with the heart, we can get a view from the, the parasternal long view is what we call it. Um, and it gives us a good image of the heart and we can see just about everything we need to, uh, we're able to determine if the, uh, the walls are collapsing uh, effectively. So is the heart actually contracting the way it's supposed to? We can look at the valves of the heart. Um, for instance, if the heart is extremely stiff, the leaflets of the valves are not going to flop open like they normally would. They're going to be super stiff and just barely opening up. Um, and I, I think I mentioned the, the wall thickness as well. We mm -hmm. can determine how thick the wall of that left ventricle is and uh, kind of get a better idea of what's going on. So are you, are you even specifically measuring thickness of the wall or do you have enough visualization that you can look at it and say that's not how that's supposed enough to visualization work? you can look at it and you you know right away that it's abnormal so yeah for, for those who may not be too exposed to how we're doing the ultrasounds how long does it take for you squirt gel probe on chest in this parasternal long view to have a visualization of the heart how quickly do you get that information back I mean, it's instant. As soon as you find the heart on the ultrasound screen, it's it's done. It's there. You can see what you need to see. Look at it for, you know, five seconds or so. Get a good idea of what's going on and make your determination from there. But um, as far as, you know, getting the gel on and the ultrasound device on the patient, you know, that can be done within 10 seconds. 
right? It's it's super quick. I love it. How awesome. Yeah. And that's just the heart. Let's let's go a little bit inferior to the to the vena cava. Mm-hmm. You'd mentioned that. Yep. Um, we'll have to change views. Get a good good idea of the vena cava, perhaps. Tell us about evaluating the vena cava. What yeah. are you looking for? What's it even look like? Right. So the IVC, the inferior vena cava, the way we find that is we start at the, the sub-xiphoid view. Uh, normally what we'll do uh, if we're looking at the heart from the sub-xiphoid is we have the, uh, the ultrasound device kind of laying sideways. In this case, if we're looking for the IVC, we're going to prop it up vertically with the indicator pointed towards the patient's head, which just allows us to pinpoint what direction we're looking at. So we're really just going parallel to the Correct. vessel is what we're aiming for, right? Yep. And so once you start scanning, you're going to see the IVC on the screen. It takes a second to find it. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to find. But once you locate it, you can quickly tell if it is uh, right-sided failure because think about what's going on, right? If you have the right-sided failure, the fluid is backing up to the body which means that vena cava is going to be on overload. It's going to be wide open. It's not going to be moving. Traditionally with um, healthy patients, if you have a view of the IVC and they're breathing, you'll actually see that IVC kind of collapsing a little bit. And those patients with extreme right-sided failure that are over overloaded, it's just going to be wide open and it's not going to be moving at all. Mm. So, right. And what I love about this IVC assessment is that this isn't just in heart failure. This is this is a phenomenal fluid status assessment. Yeah. Because if we step back and talk about this more generally, um, patient has low blood pressure. What's our therapy? Yeah. Right. You know, two liters of saline, 14 gauge bilateral get to the right. I mean, and it's it's such an antiquated practice that we're so much better than that, that we got We got to let go of that practice because this patient's not getting perfusion, not getting circulation because it's all sitting there in the vena cava. Like yeah. if you're looking at all the volume, it's not a volume problem. Um, and it'll be phenomenal as we expand the use of ultrasound for just pure on fluid status assessments that as we deal with septic patients, we deal with trauma patients, mm-hmm. um, we're gonna be so much better than just uh, dumping full of a lot of fluid. Right. We can be a lot more targeted. Okay, so we see uh, ventricle walls-ish moving, kind of. We mm-hmm. see stiff, valves on the ultrasound. We see the vena cava engorged and swollen, right? Um, what's what's our next step? What's the third part of that that you had mentioned? So the third area that we're going to scan is going to be the lungs. Okay. Um, that is a really simple uh, procedure to be done. Mid-clavicular, uh, again, that, that probe is going to be vertical. Um, you place it on the patient and you're gonna have to kind of work your way through the ribs to get the visual visualization of the lung. Uh, but essentially what you're looking for are what are called beelines. And uh, beelines, if you've ever seen a rocket ship take off, you see the smoke that's kind of left behind, the streaks. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, that's what beelines look at. So when, you, when you're when you looking at the ultrasound, you'll see these streaks, which is the, the fluid in the lung. And then you can diagnose that it's the left-sided failure. So your description of that was fantastic Mm -hmm. with the rocket metaphor because groups of beelines are called rockets, right? And I'm reading the literature, I'm like, that's cool. I like rockets, I'm a space nerd. And this makes a lot more sense to me now. Um, Thank goodness I have personality (laughs) with it, right? Yes, it's exactly what the beelines look like. Mm -hmm. And it makes a lot more sense to call them rockets now when you have multiple, so again, another evaluation, because you talk about the beelines being fluid, but we also look for the lungs to slide, right? Like we have the visceral and the parietal mm-hmm. pleura that are, are lubricated there. So the lung slides along the chest wall. Yep. And there's a, a very notable visualization of that slide. So here we're talking about fluid in the lungs and the edema and the congestion. Sure. This exam generalizes out as we're dealing with uh, hemoneumothorax. Correct. Um, other things that could be putting fluid into the chest cavity. So uh, again, any very few of the exams we talk about on ultrasound are this one purpose. Yeah. Really. So gives you a ton of information. Right. So we're just talking about the applications mm-hmm. in heart failure here. All right. So, I mean, we got B lines, we have stiff ventricle walls, we have the IVC backing up. What, what's going to happen next to this patient? Like, honestly, like what, what's the next step for them? As far as uh, what their body's doing, yeah. Oh, they're they're tipping over the edge, right? I mean, pads, they're, guys, pads. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, if we have the vena cava swollen up and we have stiff ventricle walls and we have the lungs full of fluid, like yeah. the whole heart has failed. Right. No, sir. We put this Lucas machine on everybody. Just put your irons here and <laughs> help you be comfortable. All right. Yeah, that's sick. Ideally, I guess there's not an ideal in heart failure, but hopefully if we're managing heart failure, we we're, we're isolated to one side that we have, uh, yes. you know, the vena cava swollen, the ankle swollen, difficulty breathing or or the pulmonary edema, difficulty breathing. Like if we go get both guys, ooh, yeah, give me an inch and an ops one. Well, we're going to hang out for a few minutes, right? Yep. So, so real quick, we actually had a patient one time. Uh, we picked him up from a rehab facility and it was whole heart failure. And so this guy was so fluid overload. You could hear him when you walked into the room. He had edema in the lungs. So we knew that right off the bat. And then his his extremities were so fluid overloaded that they were just they were massive. You couldn't even get an IV on the guy mm. when you poked him to get the the IV like fluid would just start pouring out. It was crazy. Poor guy. Yeah. So we ended up drilling this guy and, you know, took him to the hospital. But yeah, yeah just it was pretty wild to see. Yeah. So in these cases, these fluid overloaded cases, diuretics are the key. That's the therapy. Mm -hmm. But we just pulled Lasix off our truck. Yeah. Right. So let's take a minute and talk about the, the good reason for that is that we have a very short amount of time with these patients. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to do that kind of fluid status management of, um, in and out. Like, we need a longer patient relationship at this time. We need better monitoring on as, as we go through that. Correct. So, and additionally, these patients may not be fluid overloaded. This one sound, absolutely sounds fluid overloaded. But if I look at ankles that are big and puffy like tree trunks, and I just said, man, I'm, that person's fluid overloaded. I go give them some Lasix like we traditionally would. I might be taking away some of the fluid they need to be compensating for this condition. We just need to yeah. support the pump in other ways. So it was a broad brush to paint with to throw diuretics at somebody in some type of heart failure mm -hmm. without the determination of being fluid overloaded or not. So as we hear with ultrasound, we have a little bit better picture of the fluid status, uh, but a swollen vena cava does not tell us fluid overloaded. It just tells us where it's accumulated. Correct. Right. So, when, when you wonder that, hey, diuretics are a fantastic heart failure treatment, this is true. Absolutely true. Need more information for that to be the best therapy. Yeah. Right. So let's, uh, so let's talk about nitro then, right? Nitro vasodilates. It reduces our afterload. It reduces our preload. How do we give a nitro right now? So right now we're doing sublingual. Sublingual. That's, that's how our organization is doing Classic. it right now. Yep. Classic. Yep. Sublingual nitro. nitro. So you got to be quick with it, right? Yep. Because so, what are we going towards next? CPAP. Mm. So here's the kicker. And in case you didn't hear it before, our last update of the guidelines, it's a double dose of nitro before we get the CPAP on. And this is why, right? We're going to double up on nitro because that's what's going to help this person mm -hmm. vasodilate and reduce these pressures we're fighting against. Because we don't want to take CPAP on and off. Right. Right. This, the time you go break a seal, there goes your peep. There goes the benefits of it. Alveolar collapse. Right. We lose yep. all the benefit. Right back to square one. So that's why you're going to see an increased dose up front when we're dealing with uh, pulmonary edema with heart failure patients. Um, but maybe there's some other options yes. that we need to talk about. So uh, IV nitro is a thing. Mm -hmm. IV medications. Right. Fantastic. IV nitrates. And... Um, there's pros and cons to any of these routes, right? So Correct. we talked about sublinguals limitation and you, you lose some of it to swallowing it. So not all of it gets absorbed. Um, you lose the route as soon as CPAP goes on. Mm -hmm. So, right. So IV, we need a line. We need access. You right. already described your patient. That's a challenge in access. Exactly. Um, just like anything, you need to take the time to verify the medication, draw up the medication, administer the medication and, it's not like IV nitro has a long half-life any more than sublingual nitro. I mean, nitro is nitro. Right. So it's going to wear off. We got to give again. Mm -hmm. um, one that I'm a fan of that we talked a little bit about before we were starting the show was, was nitro paste. Yeah. And it's transdermal. Transdermal route. And it, it's like an older one mm -hmm. that, I, I don't know, like fell out of practice, came, came back around a little bit back. It's phenomenal. Um because I think ideally, if somebody was that sick, an IV infusion of nitroglycerin is, is like primo. Yeah. Right. Like maintain therapeutic effect. 
the next best thing we can do is this paste. Mm -hmm. We put the paste on somebody and it's just constant absorption, steady therapeutic effect, no peaks and valleys like we get with even sublingual, right? Uh, you know, or IV bolusing. So not a terrible thought mm -hmm. and definitely something on my list that we're, we're looking at and seeing if that's the practice we want to go towards is nitro paste. Um, but I'm going to send this one over to you because there's one more route that has come up in all of our discussions of heart failure. Yep. And what's some things that you found in addition to those routes of, of medication administration? Yeah. So the the last way of administering nitro we're going to talk about is, is uh, nebulized nitro. Inhaling it. Inhaling it. Correct. <laughs> and so uh, I listened to a podcast that you had sent kind of uh, talking about nebulized nitro. And I dug further into it, did some research on it and um, found out that the nebulized nitro became really popular during COVID-19. And so there was a hospital, uh, I believe it was in New York, um, excuse me if I get some of this stuff wrong, but uh, essentially they found nebulized nitro to be a really good treatment for these COVID-19 patients. And they were doing it so much that they ended up running out of the nebulized version and so they started making their own out of the sublingual. They were like crushing up, mixing it with saline. It, it had such an effect. And so we talk about right-sided heart failure, right? And like, what's the issue? Is it is it the the pulmonary hypertension? Mm -hmm. You know, is, is that the issue that's going on? Well, most likely it is. And so if if the right side of the heart is struggling to push blood into that area, why not just isolate it, neb nitro, open up those pulmonary vessels? and make it a lot easier for that that right ventricle to start pumping into. Man, that's pretty fantastic. Like that, I think that's really cool. And the, the literature you found that you sent over, um, how dang cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, we talk about local anesthetics, you know, applied right mm -hmm. where we need it. Nitro applied right where we need it. Um, and what's neat about the nitro, again, because heart failure is secondary to a condition, and let's not play this game where that's the one condition this person had. Like these are sick oh, yeah. people, right? Sick, sick people. The benefits of inhaling nitro, nebulizing it, is that localized response entirely. Like it works in the pulmonary system. You don't get systemic vasodilation the way you do with any of the other routes. So talk mm -hmm. about uh, like target specific therapy for crying out loud. Uh, point. I mean, that, that, that's awesome that if what we really all we need is to reduce this pulmonary pressure that we're pumping against. Fabulous. Right. right. So some tricks with it, though. I mean, it's got to get absorbed into the into the lungs to mm -hmm. be active. So uh, good chance the person's still going to be on some CPAP, some yep. type of ventilatory support. So um, none of these are, are their own isolated thing. But I'm excited to look at what other alternatives should we be talking about in heart failure, uh, even just in the nitrates, yeah. right? We, we talk about sublingual, like, I think we kind of outgrown sublingual nitro in heart failure for sure right now, right? So it's always uh, a pain. It, it, it is. Every patient. You know, and there's a place and we're still going to use it in coronary syndromes, still yeah. standard practice there for sure. But if we're going to put a CPAP mask on somebody in heart failure, we, we need something else, mm -hmm. right? So Stand by for that exciting discussion and some of that information in which, by the way, any of the stuff we're talking about, we're going to link the articles and make them available to you. None of this is a secret. Uh, this is this is all information sharing. So watch out for nebulizers coming up. <laughs> so CPAP, though, right? Yep. So CPAP, our, our problem in pulmonary edema is the reduced lung capacity. It's the... Uh, inability to fill the alveoli. Yep. Right. CPAP goes in and addresses that. It actually, it helps our airway pressures by opening things up. So think about uh, pumping through a five inch hose and the amount of friction loss and how much pressure we need to flow a volume of water through versus our inch and three quarter attack lines where there's going to be a lot more turbulence and we need some more pressure to overcome that. CPAP's going to help take the pulmonary trunk from an inch and three quarter line to that five, hopefully that five inch line, maybe closer to a two and a half, but yeah, it's going to make it bigger. So volume can move without as much friction in there, without as much turbulence, right? Um, alveolar recruitment is the fancy word. It just expands the alveoli mm -hmm. more. And have you heard, so you've heard this one that CPAP shoves fluid back in to the, the vessels. Yes. Are you ever taught that one? Oh yeah. Guys false. Okay. <laughs> Does not. 
what it does is it takes the amount of space that has fluid filled in it and it stretches the space so there's actual alveolar wall to exchange gas that doesn't have fluid on it, okay? We just make the space bigger. The volume of fluid doesn't change, but we now gain space to exchange gas. That's how CPAP's gonna help us in, in the pulmonary edema patients, okay? Um, that's why sitting these people up a bit helps too, is we let gravity pull that fluid to the bottom of that alveolar sac that it's in, mm -hmm. so that we have the whole rest of the, the alveoli to exchange the gas. So. Uh, we restore our residual functional capacity. Um, it it reduces our need to intubate these patients. Yes. Because we talked about difficulty breathing. Um, they're tired. Like breathing's hard work. And when you have to breathe like this much energy, your heart rate's up. You're not getting the oxygen circulating like you need to for muscles to work. Like that's exhausting. Yeah. That's it's kind of scary to think about like, right? putting yourself in the patient's shoes. We've all seen that fatigue patient where they're just like, they're done, Man. they're giving up. When I came through paramedic school, I had the really uh, fortunate, unfortunate, good circumstance that in the uh, collar suburb of Chicago, and we were like the respiratory problem capital of the Western suburbs. Like everybody had CHF, everybody had COPD. And in the amount of time I was there, I think I tubed like four or five people a week wow. for crying out loud because nobody called us till it was too late. Yeah. We get there and it was the already. And you're like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, getting to see CPAP kind of put that off goes much to the patient's benefit. I know it doesn't mean yeah. we get to tube people as much, but um, I'm going to go on a limb here and presume you have put a patient on CPAP in your career. Oh, yes. Tell us about that. Not even like the big picture of it, but how dramatic of a change was it to put this mask on somebody? It's quick. It's a quick change. Um, I will say, you know, a lot of times initially the patients are hesitant. You mm -hmm. know, they don't want it. They have that fear. But as soon as they get it and they allow it to work, they've got that nitro in and they start feeling the effects. They just kick back and, and kind of calm down. So something else I want to say too, don't be afraid when you first get there and that, that patient has that that pulmonary edema and you know that you've got to get the CPAP on to start helping them out. Uh, I've seen improvement until you get the CPAP set up and ready to go because it, it takes a few seconds to get everything together. Mm -hmm. Throw them on an honorary breather, high flow O2. Like that does wonders to throw the nitro in. It helps you get the nitro in and then work your way to that CPAP. Don't not do the CPAP. The CPAP has to get put on, but just during that lag, have somebody throw a, a non rebreather on real quick because a lot of times you'll start seeing that uh, SpO2 start creeping up even with that mm. non rebreather. But that's a good point. That's yeah, a good point. Absolutely. Mm. So, um, have you ever had patients asking for CPAP? Yes, you have one of those yep. ones, right? Like it's crazy. You're like, mm -hmm. oh, we're gonna put you on this mask. They're like, gimme, gimme, gimme. Right? Yep. They can't get it on them fast enough, and then you get the opposite end of like, no, 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 don't put anything on my face, and you got to coach them through that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and let's take a minute to appreciate that somebody's fighting this thing off their face. This person's dying. They're dying. They're suffocating. They're drowning in their own bodily fluids for crying out loud. So when somebody's getting you frustrated that it's, I know this is going to help you just put it on your face. Let's take a breath and be a little bit compassionate about that. Yeah. that this person's freaking out. Okay. Like, like high level coherent thought. That, that's not where this person is. That's where we are. Hopefully for sure. This person's not, they're in like lower alligator brain survival. I need to breathe, get things off of me. So yeah. we coach them, like you said, we coach them through that first breath or two. Ooh, okay. All right. You know, and hopefully things kind of, kind of go. Um, and going off of what you just said real quick. So yeah, you bring up a good point though. You do have those patients that are like, give it to me. You know, they know what it is. This has happened to them before. Mm -hmm. So they understand what's going on. A lot of times the patients that are hesitant, those are first timers Yep. and they're they're They don't know what's going on. They're freaking out. So Compassion goes a long way for sure. Right. So uh, let's let's take one last little point to discuss before we close this out. And that is by level positive airway pressure. So we have constant positive airway pressure. Mm -hmm. We plug it into the O2 tank. It just blasts this air in there. Um, if we're dealing with CHF patients, we may be adjusting our PEEP up to 7, 8, 10, right, to get that alveolar recruitment that we need. Yep. And these patients are trying to breathe with this constant blowing in their face. But now we got a new option that's going to be coming out to the field. And we're going to learn about it a lot this summer with the ventilators is yep. the bi-level ventilation. Um, what do you know about bi-level ventilation compared to CPAP? 
What, what kind of thoughts do you have? I think the big thing is the comfort, mm -hmm. right? It's just a lot more comfortable for the patient. Um, whenever that patient exhales, it's going to decrease the amount of pressure that it's providing, just making it a little bit easier process for the patient. Um, as far as the ventilator, ventilators are new to me, so still got a long way to go with that on <laughs> learning about functioning the ventilator. But uh, yeah, I know I know the buy level is just a lot, a lot more patient friendly. Yeah, they're gonna yeah. like you a whole lot more, a lot more comfortable. And and just to give some orientation, if you if you don't realize that CPAP is our constant pressure, right? So we mm -hmm. set our PEEP at seven. It's seven whether this patient inhales, exhales, any point in the cycle. Yep. just what it is we set up the ventilator on by level and there'll be more pressure when they inhale it'll recognize when they start to exhale and it'll drop that pressure like you said it'll maintain the peep so that we keep the lungs open mm -hmm. but then when i go to inhale again it'll dial up the pressure and give that kind of inhalation support so it is a much more comfortable thing because the pressure is kind of in tune with what part of the respiratory cycle we're assisting um, and remember these people are tired they need some help taking a breath in because that's the part that takes energy right and let's try and reduce the amount of energy they got to spend because they don't have much left right so we get to put a little bit more pressure on the inhale while still having the exhale after it so um helps our respiratory fatigue patients it is much more comfortable um it's going to be some steps to set up i mean let's let's call it what it is cpap is nice and easy you throw a mask on plug it into the bottle it's going there we are mm-hmm there's a lot of, of benefits to this patient that we take the time to set them over on bi-level. They're gonna be on bi-level when they get in the hospital. It's it's a better setup for the patient, a lot more comfortable, like you said. Yeah. So um, any thoughts you have about ventilator, bi-level, stuff that we're going for here? Um, I know, you know, we've we've done some training on the ventilator, and I just I think it's really cool when you talk about lung capacity. And what is the lung capable of taking on at that moment in time, right? And so if if there's stuff going on inside of the lung and there's fluid buildup or whatever, and we, we may have to adjust how we're providing that tidal volume, that minute tidal volume. Mm -hmm. And so we can we can adjust it so we don't harm the patient and still provide the same volume over that minute just by increasing the rate but decreasing the actual volume. And so I thought that was kind of cool. I know you've yeah you've dug into it a lot more than I have. You're you're pretty up to speed with that ventilator. Yeah, but. you know I think what what is exciting about the ventilator is all those feedback numbers like we had talked about last time we had yeah. that there's some settings that we're adjusting and some settings are feedback depending on what mode we're sitting in and you all mm -hmm. get all this education on it. Um, I get to see in a quantifiable measurement a number just how big that breath is. So if I put this patient on BiPAP and they look like they're breathing okay and their tidal volume comes back at 175 milliliters, this person's in respiratory failure. Like, yeah. like they're past bi level, they're past CPAP, right? We don't get that that feedback on CPAP. So, um, but we get to have that real time watching their rate, their effort, how much air they're actually moving. So it's, I mean, it's all, a, it's, what a fantastic tool. It's fantastic. Yeah. Every truck's gonna have a ventilator. Everybody's going to get spun up on the ventilator, and this is by no means a paramedic only thing. Like I, I expect everybody to be familiar with what we're doing with this device. So um, I will tell you now that there are alarms. The ventilator will alarm. It'll make noise at you. The solution is not take them off the vent and put it away and turn it off mm -hmm. because the thing that caused the alarm is still there. So we're going to have a lot of good practice at reconciling those alarms and how do we troubleshoot yeah. as well. So awesome. Captain Bell, I appreciate your time in preparing for this episode, some of the good information you found that we we put in here, uh, and your time coming in to talk about it. Absolutely. Today. Not a problem. So any other closing comments you want to throw in there? That's it. Awesome. Appreciate man. your time. You got it. Well, hopefully you guys are uh, stepping away from this with a little bit uh, different perspective on heart failure, how we treat heart failure, and what might be to come in the future as we become next level clinical providers and how we manage heart failure. So... There you have it. And until next time, thanks.